Welcome to the Spooky Tales podcast presented by me, John. And me, Louise. We have been fascinated by spooky goings on since we can remember and wanted to share with you the stories that pique our interest. Today's story is of hauntings, possession, poltergeist, psychological manipulation and an unexpected twist. It's the spooky tale of the ghosts of Cornwall. Welcome or welcome back to the Spooky Tales podcast. Shout out to the video creator on Instagram, Andrew's Visual. We highly recommend you go and follow them. Also shout out to the lovely YouTube followers, Wendy from Oz, Darren from the USA, Mama Cass and Bacon and the Biscuits. No, just Bacon and Biscuits. Just they great names, all, all of them. So John, what's this spooky tale all about? This spooky tale is of the ghosts of Cornwall. Cornwall is in the southwest of the United Kingdom, the very furthest you can go southwest. So let's jump straight into a tale from Mounts Bay. Mounts Bay is a beautiful area, probably most famous for St Michael's Mount. For now, let me tell you one of the reports from many fishermen who hear a ghostly voice call the words, I will, I will over and over again with the faint sound of church bells far out in the bay. Over a century ago, there was a young woman named Sarah who lived with her husband, a much older man called Paul Grain. Sarah became involved with a young sailor known as Yorkshire Jack. Sarah decided it was time to move on from doddery old Paul Grain and slowly poisoned him with arsenic. She was cunning enough that the doctor was satisfied it was natural causes and signed the death certificate accordingly. However, such was the brazen behaviour of Sarah and her lover, Yorkshire Jack, so soon after Paul Grain's death, that rumours of foul play dogged them until one day Paul Grain's body was exhumed and the arsenic poisoning discovered. Sarah was charged and convicted of the murder of her husband and sentenced to be hanged from the neck until dead. I always think that's really gruesome, that, when it says sentenced to be hanged from the neck. I know, that's right. I mean, yes. You can't be hanged from another place. Well, you, well, could, you could, but it wouldn't. But it's just the way they say, yeah. hanged from, from the, the neck. neck. Till dead. Yeah. Because that's the phrase. I know, it is. Yeah. I know. But it's, it's it, there is something about it, isn't there? Absolutely. It was a public execution, which is another thing. That you bowl up to the, you know, to I watch know, someone. I know, that's die. unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it happens today, of course. Not so much here. Oh, does it? Well, in America. It's not public. Oh, is it not? No. Oh, I thought it was. No. I, well, I know there aren't crowds or anything when it's no, not put on wit- TV. It's witnessed so yes. that everything's seen as all fair and above board. But can't the, there's, can't the sort of family of the victim uh, go? Oh. I don't know if it's every time. I don't know enough about it, but no, I, I, don't, think it, yeah, I don't think it's Before public. Before I start spreading rumours. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. No, it's not public. No, no, okay. Well, this one was a public execution, and Sarah, as a last request, asked that Yorkshire Jack might be allowed to accompany her onto the scaffold. He accompanied her onto the gallows platform, and as the rope was being placed around Sarah's neck, they kissed one more time. As they parted, Sarah was heard to say, in a careful and deliberate tone. You will, Jack. You promise you will. To which Yorkshire Jack was heard to say, I will, Sarah. I will. In the days after her execution, her ghost was seen in the village of Ludvan, not far from Penzance, in the churchyard, where her and Yorkshire Jack would meet and on the road between Penzance and Hale. However, it was Jack who saw Sarah's ghost most often. His carefree demeanour changed overnight. He became a morose, short-tempered, restless and unhappy man. Well, you might expect that of a man who's just lost the love of his life and had to go through the trauma of seeing her executed. I'm surprised he didn't move away. He didn't. He had friends and he continued as a sailor. He confided in those friends that she was there wherever he went. Is that what he promised? Well, what did you think he promised? 
that he he would be there for her or would he kill himself? Is that what he promised? Let's find out. Okay. Otherwise, I might shorten the story. Is that what he promised? <laughs> Did he? Did I guess? Well, well, let's find out. Oh, okay. Okay, go on, come on. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> he could not escape Sarah, even at sea. His sea mates thought he was going mad, for he could always see her, which they could not. After weeks at sea, Yorkshire Jack returned to Mount's Bay and confided once more in his mates the nature of the promise that he had made Sarah on the scaffold on that day of her execution. He had promised on his oath that on that very day at midnight, he would marry her. Oh, what, when she was dead? Yes. Thinking to comfort her in her last moments on earth, he had of course agreed. Was it he'd agreed that he would marry her even though she was a dead person? Yes. But ever since that day, she had never left him. Lordy, was she really wanted to extract something from him, didn't she? <laughs> That's right. Jack looked up at his friends and said, in a weak and defeated voice, but not being able to wed me in the flesh, she means to bind me in her, to her. He said in a weak and defeated voice, but not being able to wed me in the flesh, she means to bind me to her forever in death. Oh my word. I thought it was that he was going to, well, as you know, that he was, gonna, he was going to kind of meet her in death as in he was going to... Jump off or something. Uh, yeah, he was going to kill But no, he wanted to... Uh, to oh, yeah, so he, that took a turn. Uh, indeed. So later that night at midnight, the ship's company were awakened by someone walking to where Jack lay sleeping. The footsteps were light. They weren't heavy with boots, but delicate shoes. Jack was seen to arise from his hammock with terror in his eyes oh dear. and forlornly walk on the deck with the delicate footsteps behind him. Ooh. Jack climbed the bulwark of the ship and leapt into the sea, never to be seen again. Oh no! His shipmates said that they could hear the far off chiming of church bells, believing that they were hearing his and Sarah's ghostly wedding. Oh, this is worse than I thought. <laughs> yes. Sarah had kept Jack to his word. From she then had. on, far out in Mounts Bay, there have been reports of phantom wedding bells and a forlorn voice calling, I will, I will, or it's lost on the wind. Ooh, well, Sarah sounds like a no-nonsense sort of girl. She wasn't going to let him renege on his promise, was she? It does remind me of another story up on the north coast of Cornwall, near the town of St Agnes. What, as in St Agnes and the Bolster the Giant? No, no, actually, not that one, although that is a good one too. This concerns a lady called Dorcas, whose husband dies in a mining accident. So devastated was she by his tragic death that she went to the Polbreen mine at the foot of the St Agnes Beacon where he had died and threw herself down the deep mine shaft. She lay there, broken and dead, until she was discovered the next day. Dorcas, however, never left the mine. Her spirit was mischievous and would delight in tormenting miners by calling their name and alluring them away from their tasks. It happened so often that a miner would be accused of chasing Dorcas if his wages, based on a profit share of the sales of ore, were lower than expected. Ah, I might use that if I've not done all of that I've set up to do during the day because I've been distracted by something. Yeah, you've been chasing Dorcas. Yes, that's quite a good phrase. Mm. Okie doke. Well, next time I go, I must have a look for the mine. I haven't seen it yet, have you? I think, well, I think we must have Yeah, we it. have. We've seen it. It's on the way to the um, Driftwood. Yes, that's right. Ah, of course. Well. Dr yes, the Driftwood Inn, a very fine Cornish hostelry. Yes, indeed it is. Down in Trevornan's Cove. Well, while we're talking of spooky tales in St Agnes, before we head back to Mounts Bay, I'll tell you the legend of the Cornish giant called Bolster. He was so tall and so big that he could stand with one foot on the beacon above the village in which he lived, St Agnes, and the other in Carn Bray, some six miles away near Redruth. Bolster 
terrorized the villagers and his poor wife Gonetta. One day, Bolster came across a kind and beautiful woman called Agnes. He pursued her and would not leave her alone. One day, she challenged Bolster to a bet. This was witnessed by the villagers. If he won, she would marry him. If he lost, he would leave the village. All he had to do was fill a small hole in the cliffs above the beach with his blood. He agreed, but was not aware that the hole was not shallow. It went all the way to the beach below. Bolster became weaker and weaker and died as his blood drained away through the hole into the ocean below. The village of St Agnes celebrates this legend every year in May in the festival of Bolster Day. It's a brilliant festival and they reenact St Agnes exanuating, which is... Uh, taking all the blood out of someone. Bolster on the cliffs. Yes. So when they said she was a kind person, it's, uh, is, that, is that still come under kind, exanuating well, the giant? He was he was a, a vicious giant. That's true. Giant. true. He so wasn't very nice. From, so in that way she was kind. From the villagers' point of view. She was kind to everybody else. Yes. Just not to the giant. No, no. he was not kind to himself. That's true. He got yes. what he deserved. Then. Well, I know there might be some giants out there who, who disagree with. Yes. If you are, please do let us know at the Speak Tales podcast on Instagram. Yes, where were we? Uh, we were talking about Bolster. Ah, yes. They have this amazing model of the giant that takes several people to operate it, which must be quite tricky on the cliffs. Yes. They, they are quite sort of steep. And, yeah, they are very steep yeah. cliffs. Yes, and they then have a parade in town, followed by further merriment into in the small hours. Uh, much drinking is had. Much merriment is made. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, let's head back down the A30 to Mounts Bay and the town of Penzance, where there are a good number of hauntings. The ghost of Maisie Bain has been seen in Chapel Street wearing a cloak and bonnet. Those who have witnessed the apparition say that she fades away into a wall. She was the owner of a property in Penzance and hired a man to look after the property when she was away. Unfortunately, she was shot by this man by accident when she returned home unexpectedly one night. Now, one apparition you definitely don't want to see is the black dog that appears in the harbour, or it is a harbinger of death for those that see it. Now, don't let this put you off going to Penzance though. It is a great town with a one-of-a-kind bookshop called the Edge of the World Bookshop on Market Jew Street. Once you've finished perusing the bookshop, you can swim at the beautifully refurbished 1930s Lido or outdoor pool. Probably be in need of refreshment by this time, and just around the corner from the Lido is the Dolphin Inn, one of Cornwall's oldest inns. It has two ghosts. There is an old sea captain who died there and those that claim to see him describe him as a swarthy man wearing a tricorn hat. He is either seen or makes himself known by heavy footsteps marching across the ceiling and continuing down the stairs on occasion. The second ghost is a phantom form of a young man who fell to his death in 1873 in the main cellar. Room 4 and Room 5 would be my recommendation if you stay there. The chair in Room 4 has a cushion which has a mysterious depression in it. No matter how often the cushion is shaken up and replaced, the mysterious depression always returns. And in room five, something similar occurs when an indentation appears in the pillow and on the bed, as if someone is sleeping or resting there. That would be really awful if you were on the next pillow. Yes, absolutely. And you saw the depression. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's not, not an unusual haunting. There are quite a lot of stories like that where people see the depression, you know, actually forming. Oh, I wouldn't like that. Right next to them. No, thank you. Yeah, now that would make you want to find a different room. Sometimes. Yes, I was thinking. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a goodbye <laughs> from me now. Unless you you know you're into the haunting thing and then and you're not spooked by that sort of stuff. I would be spooked. Yeah, I would too probably. I would mean, like to think that I wouldn't be, but I probably would. Not far from the Dolphin and the Jubilee Lido is Morab Road. Here, there is a house which used to be a doctor's surgery, then an old people's home. A shadowy figure of a man is seen by patients and staff as he stands by a window. He is thought to be the ghost of a doctor. He has also been seen by two girls who knew nothing of the history of the house. They saw a man walk along the hall and disappear into the room that once served as the surgery. 
The two girls investigated at once and found the room empty. Later that night, they saw the same man take the same route into the old surgery. The girls refused to come back into the house after that. If you continue westward past Newlyn, you come to a charming harbour at Mausel. Here you will find the Ship Inn. Now, proprietors past and present of the Ship Inn do not claim that there are any ghosts there and view reports of such as nonsense. However, there have been several people who have seen an apparition of a man leaning against the wall wearing modern clothes. Amanda Casson had just finished having a bath and was walking down the corridor. Anywhere in particular? Well, well, back to her room, I suppose. I suppose she may have been on her way to the bar, but I'm not sure it's that sort of hotel, to be honest. Anyway, she was walking down the corridor when she saw a man leaning against the wall. As she approached him, he faded away, leaving the corridor deserted and empty. She said that she watched in amazement. She could see him grow fainter and fainter before disappearing completely. There was another gentleman who was helping with some structural work to the hotel when, as he walked along one of the upper corridors, there was a man ahead of him. There was nothing untoward about the man except that he disappeared in front of him. One moment he was there, the next he had vanished. Our final story on this episode is set on the road from Falmouth to Helston, just 15 miles or so east of Penzance on the southern side of Cornwall. Let me take you back to a dark and stormy night on the 18th of July in 1952. Now, for those of you with a head for dates, you might recall that just a few weeks later, on the 15th and 16th of August in 1952, there were disastrous floods in Lynmouth, up on the north coast of Devon. After weeks of heavy rain, the floods came in the night, demolishing homes and dragging cars into the sea. 34 lives were lost that night in a scene which was eerily repeated in the Cornish town of Boscastle not that long ago, also on the 15th of August in 2004. Actually, we 2004 were... is actually quite a long time ago now. It's not really, it's only a... <laughs> so, not that long ago, it's like... Yes, oh, it doesn't it seem 15, that long ago. 15 years ago. Oh, goodness me. Yeah. Amazingly, well, of course, we were coming back home after a weekend down in St Agnes. So we were going up the A13, practically on a level with Boss Castle when we heard it on the news, didn't we? And stunningly, we had had the most glorious weekend. Yeah, weather-wise, and, beautiful. And been playing in the sea for the entire weekend, you know, wall-to-wall, blue skies and sunshine, and they'd had the most awful floods and we only found out about it because we got caught in traffic yes yeah and, and that was one of the reasons but by a miracle no one was killed even though it decimated the town in a very similar way to Lynmouth the houses and buildings were washed away cars washed out to sea anyway back to the stormy night in July of 1952 a young farmhand named Terry Bray had been visiting his uncle and had enjoyed himself so much that he forgot the time and soon realised that he had missed the last bus home from Falmouth. Do you think he'd been enjoying himself in an inn? Possibly. It could have been that way. That's the kind of times that you forget the time, isn't it? Yeah, so you forget it because you're enjoying yourself with an alcoholic beverage. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Oh no, I've missed the last bus. Terry had to get home that night, so he borrowed his uncle's Macintosh and set off in the torrential downpour. Terry was in luck and managed to get a lift up the steep hill to Penryn. He still had many miles to walk. It was about 11 o'clock. And about two and a half miles further on at Longdowns, he saw a young female walking ahead of him. He quickened his pace and as he got near, he saw she was wearing only a summer dress. He called to her and she waited for him to catch up. Terry quickly took off his Macintosh and put it around her shoulders. She gave him a smile and thanked him in a broad Cornish dialect. The young girl was called Susie, and she said that she lived down the lane near the Kidley. What's a Kidley? Well, it's an old Cornish word for a pub. Terry knew that the next pub was about a mile away, roughly 15, 20 minutes walk in this weather, in, in, the, in that particular way. The driving rain made any conversation very difficult. They reached the lane that Susie had spoken of, and she turned and gave Terry a peck on the cheek. He gasped as she was so cold. He thought the girl must be freezing and implored her to keep the Macintosh 
and that he'd pick it up the next day, Susie agreed. Terry asked if he could walk her to her door. She smiled and said, I don't be like that if you know what I mean. Terry understood. Susie gave him another peck on his cheek and hurried off down the lane. Was he suggesting something more than just a walk down the lane? Well, could have been. Mm. She's not like that. Good. She just met him. Yes, exactly. So, Terry watched her until she disappeared in the dark and the mist of the rain. He walked the rest of the way home, arriving about midnight. And I checked this on a map. He, he must have really shifted. Really? Absolutely. Quite, quite some way, is it? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, he definitely wasn't... Yeah, he, he was, wasn't dawdling. He was not dawdling, no. Imagine driving rain, you don't really. Well, I suppose that's a good point, yeah. Next day, Terry worked on the farm as usual, and after a hearty tea that his mother had cooked for him, he decided to go and see Susie. After all, as he explained to his mother, he needed to get the Macintosh back to give to his uncle. She gave him a knowing look and with a smile saw him on his way. He reached the lane where he and Susie had parted the night before and he walked down it until he came to an old cottage. It was run down and needed some attention. He knocked at the door. He heard what he thought was an old woman's voice shout to come in. Again in a strong Cornish dialect. Terry, a little uncertain at this point, opened the door and stepped in. It was dark and musty inside and he had a hard job adjusting to the light. Eventually, he could make out an old woman by the fireplace sitting on a rocking chair. The fireplace was unlit and didn't look like it had been lit for years. I'm Terry Bray, he had said finally to break the silence of the creaking rocking chair. The old woman said she knew who he was, that she had been expecting him. She said that Susie had told her that he'd be along. Is Susie here? he asked nervously. The old woman continued to rock back and forth in the chair before telling Terry that her name was Molly Trembath and that Susie was a daughter. She told him that Susie had left a message for him to go and meet her in the churchyard where she was waiting for him. Molly then laughed and cackled as Terry thanked the old lady and made his way to the churchyard to see Susie. When he got there, he could not see her. He waited and shouted her name, but there was no response. He thought Susie must be hiding from him as a game, so he went to look for her. Did he find her? Yes. Yes, he did. As he was walking amongst the graves, he saw one with a Macintosh draped over one of the headstones. It looked just like his uncle's that he had lent to Susie. Oh, she is here, he thought. And as he got to the headstone and took off the Macintosh unveiling the headstone, he read the inscription. It said, R.I.P. Susie Trembath, murdered in this parish on the 18th day of July, 1852. 1852? That's right, exactly 100 years before. Well, he'd spoken to her mother. Yes. So that she was a ghost as well. Yes. He wasn't, oh my gosh. <laughs> it was just a whole bunch of ghosts. Oh, so he'd be kissed on the cheek by a ghost? Yes. He'd suggested that he'd walk down a lane with a ghost. Mm -hmm. And then that was his mother. Yeah, but she was nice she enough was... to give the Macintosh back. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, my word. So there we go. Another spooky tale. Very spooky tale, actually. Yes. We hope you enjoyed this spooky tale. We look forward to joining you again next time. If you enjoyed these spooky tales, please do tell others and please leave us a review. It can really help other people to find us who might enjoy our podcast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please do tell us your spooky tales either in the YouTube comments or by email. Which is the spooky tales podcast at gmail.com. And come and follow us on Instagram at the spooky tales podcast. Or why not visit us on our Facebook page at spooky tales. Thanks again. And until next time. Bye. Bye.